Welcome to this webcast. My name is Taro Eichler. Um, I'm market segment manager for wireless communication. And um, I would like to explain a little bit regarding millimeter and terahertz wave technologies and applications uh, in the next 35 minutes. Currently, network operators worldwide are rolling out 5G and um, the first step is enhanced mobile broadband. The next step for the next years will be vertical industries so that they will drive 5G evolution. Um, one of these um, bodies is, for example, the 5G AA, the 5G Automotive Association, or 5G ACIA, the 5G um, Alliance for Connected Industries. Um, but 6G research is already starting now in industry and academia as well. So there's some Technology is already identified, or but these are all candidates, of course. Supermassive MIMO could be one, um, AI, machine learning for optimized networks, um, and subterrahertz waves so are definitely a field which is maybe the most concrete uh, everybody is working on in this direction. And um, another Interesting aspect could be uh, for security, so quantum key distribution using single photons to transmit um, data because uh, single photons cannot be copied. Um, this kind of communication is uh, cannot be eavesdropped and is therefore intrinsically secure. So that may be a component and uh, many more are being discussed as well. Ode Schwarz is uh, active also in 6D research. So one of the activities is um, regarding terahertz channel sounding or terahertz um, yeah, communication at high frequencies. So we looked at 300 gigahertz, for example, in cooperation with Fraunhofer um, Institutes. I will talk later on about that. Let's have a look at the spectrum for 5G and beyond. If you look at the upper graph, then on the very left side, you see the 5G FR1 spectrum with the aggregate spectrum of 1.3 gigahertz. In this area also lies Wi-Fi and LTE, of course. Then we have the 5G FR2 frequency spectrum. Um, this is a dark blue um, going up to 52 gigahertz. Then um, if you go even further, so the lower part up to 52 gigahertz is basically the area for 5G. And if you look beyond uh, 52 gigahertz, then this is an area which uh, includes potential new bands, 5G bands, uh, and also the 60 gigahertz unlicensed uh, spectrum. So it's a called, so part of this from 60 to 90 gigahertz is the so-called EBAT. So this area is uh, considered for 5G evolution or 5G+. plus. If you need higher bandwidth, and this is of course the case uh, if you want higher data rates uh, in the case of 6G, then we need to look even to higher frequencies beyond 100 gigahertz. And here you see the D band uh, in the area of 150 gigahertz, then the H band around 300 gigahertz, and uh, the World Radio Conference already has identified bands in this H-band or uh, at frequencies beyond 275 gigahertz, which uh, could be potentially used for the future. And this is also one of the main research area. So the H-band frequency and the D-band frequency in the 150 gigahertz. So depending on the where you look in the electromagnetic spectrum, there are various applications for which these frequency can be used. Starting on the left, uh, we see, for example, the radio waves. This is in astronomy, but also broadcast radio and TV. Going to higher frequencies is the area of the cell phones. Then we already there at the millimeter wave and terahertz region. So the terahertz region is considered to start at 300 gigahertz up to three terahertz. But some people also say it's between 0 0.1 um, giga, uh, 0 0.1 terahertz, so 100 gigahertz up to uh, 10 terahertz. So it depends. Yeah, in that area, and one application is terahertz imaging, what we'll talk about today as well. Then uh, going to higher frequencies in the infrared region, then uh, infrared thermal cameras, of course. Then uh, later, so at higher frequencies is the visible light region. 
then ultraviolet region, which is used in medicine a lot, and X-ray imaging to even higher frequencies, and gamma rays, which is used for uh, cancer therapy, for example, uh, because it kills living cells. One aspect which determines how terahertz waves uh, behave is their interaction with matter, and that's what we want to have a look at quickly. Here in this graph, um, you see the frequency and uh, so the terahertz region basically here in this picture it's shown from 0 0.1 uh, terahertz so 100 gigahertz up to 10 terahertz and in this area lie for example the rotation uh, transition so rotation transition of molecules here in this picture you see for example a, a water molecule then bond vibration stretching and, and phonons so these are lattice vibrations so, um, and terahertz waves have certain yeah, uh, properties. So, exa for example, terahertz waves can penetrate through materials which are not uh, transparent for other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah, packaging materials, for example, as plastic, ceramic, and so on. Um, and it's also, the, the energy is very low, so it does not induce any chemical changes uh, or uh, structures in the chemical structure. Uh, changes in the chemical structure. And also it can be used to create images uh, and transmit information. That's what we will have a look at today. The big question is uh, how to generate terahertz radiation. And there are several possibilities. So here again, you see the spectrum. Um, one way is to do up conversions coming from the lower end of the spectrum. The other possibility is coming from the higher end of the spectrum uh, to do down conversion. And each of these ways um, has its uh, yeah, advantages and disadvantages. So if you look at the up conversion, then um, there are electronic sources. For example, there are multiplier chains. It's also what we do um, a lot. Then there are RTDs, so resonant tunnel tunneling diodes, transistors, and so on. The advantage is it is compact. It is at room temperature. But at some point, there's a bandwidth limitation and the efficiency is limited. Coming from the upper part of the spectrum, optoelectronics, um, there are, what you can do is, for example, you can create a beat signal with two lasers and a beat signal, then mix it on a photodiode, so it's so called UTC uh, photodiode, uh, and it's connected to antenna and then transmit terahertz radiation. Um, it is tunable because the lasers are tunable. It is at room temperature, it's also good, but the power is limited and the efficiency as well. Then there's a way to, and this has evolved in last years, uh, to directly generate terahertz radiation. Um, and one of these possibilities, which I quickly talk about uh, next slide, is the quantum um, cascade laser. And um, there are other ways using nonlinear optics, which also have less efficiency, molecular lasers, which are very inefficient, but uh, the power is um, pretty much okay. But some, the problem is sometimes, for example, in the uh, QCL uh, case, you have to use uh, cryogenic equipment, which means it's very bulky and you have to cool it to very low temperatures, maybe like 50 Kelvin. The terahertz region is still an area where it is difficult to efficiently generate uh, radiation. That's why it has been termed the terahertz gap. Here in this picture, you see uh, an overview. It's the output power versus frequency. The frequency in the terahertz region, for example, between 1 and 10 or 0 0.1 uh, to 10 terahertz. And one sees the different technologies, for example, like UCL, like a quantum cascade laser, um, or other uh, MMICs um, and other technologies. And um, what it becomes apparent is that the power goes down uh, tremendously in the area of the terror, so called terahertz gap. Uh, uh, this is now improving, so there are some technologies uh, promising, um, but uh, yeah, that's still the current status. One interesting example um, which has developed uh, in the last years is the so-called quantum cascade lasers, where you use, um, you have a semiconductor super lattice 
And uh, in this lattice, you here, for example, shown in the picture is a so-called quantum well. Um, and you have, instead of intra-band transitions yeah, between different bands, um, such as for optical laser diodes, here you have the inter subband transitions because the energies are quite low uh, in the terahertz regime and uh, to get uh, laser, uh, yeah, laser radiation. But this is uh, improving a lot, but there are also other ways to um, create terahertz radiation, which we'll talk about later. So already demonstrations have been done um, at high frequencies, for example, at 300 gigahertz, uh, point-to-point uh, -point transmission for backhaul, for example, uh, with a transmission rate of 100 gigabit per second. This has been done in the group of uh, Ducourneau uh, in France. And this is a live or was a demo at the so-called terahertz states in Dunkirk in 2017. So the transmitter is at uh, TX here and the receiver is uh, at a distance of 300, uh, sorry, 750 meters. Um, and, well, you have to very precisely um, align transmitter and receiver, and, um, but you could get 100 gigabit per second uh, transmission, so that's uh, quite, quite remarkable. And uh, still, although it is in a harbor, and on the left side here you see the um, absorption, atmospheric absorption, which increases the frequency, it was possible still uh, under these circumstances also to um, get a sufficient uh, transmission. We talked about the application of high-speed communication. Now let's have a look at other applications such as non-destructive imaging, for example, for security checks and material analysis. On the left side you see a picture or a photo of a man with the newspaper, for example, and um, on the right side so um, you see the same uh, man standing, um, but this was this picture was made with a terahertz image. Strictly speaking, it's not terahertz, but it was at uh, 94 gigahertz, but uh, still it's already in a high frequency region. And uh, well, I mean, you is visible, for example, this knife. So that that could be one application. Um, and I will also show other actually a product from Roland Schwarz, which uh, does the same thing. Um, another application is uh, the analysis of molecules. So here on the right side you see a terahertz spectrum of a sample of diclofenac acid. Um, it's the chemical name for Voltaren. Voltaren is basically a painkiller. And uh, terahertz radiation can distinguish between two of it different chemical forms um, shown on the upper part and the lower part. So this just should underline that, well, for these large molecules, for example, this is uh, pharmaceutical molecules, uh, terahertz spectroscopy is a way to distinguish these because they just lie, or these kind of different chemical compound differences just lie in this frequency region. Radio Metaphysics is a company which also belongs to Roland Schwarz. Um, it has specialized in the past on radiometers, um, but also has other products such as Doppler radar and, and many more. So also and very active in satellite communication or uh, parts, components for satellite communication. This product now is um, made for investigation of cloud and um, cloud formation, but also uh, for example, quantitative um, analysis of or estimation of precipitations such as rain um, and, and so on, or cloud particles. And we will have a quick look at that. Here, just shown some application examples uh, where at different sites it, it is used. Um, quick remark it operates at 94 gigahertz, so it's already in the higher millimeter wave region. With the cloud radar, you can uh, analyze the different levels uh, of clouds, for example, here high level cloud layers, middle level cloud layers, low level cloud layers, and precipitation. So that is, for example, rain. And um, on the right side, you see also uh, different altitudes. Again, um, the, for example, ice formation, ice particles, and, and so on. So a very detailed analysis of uh, depending on the height. 
Here's another interesting picture on the left side. You see, for example, again, small ice particles, which, um, and because in radar you use also Doppler, so you can, you can also measure the velocity of the particles, yeah, if they're just um, at a very low velocity at the same height or dropping. And um, for example, you see also in the cloud formation, for example, these updrafts, but also uh, droplets here in the lower part, droplets, these is, for example, rain, um, and they fall faster. That's why they're in a different color, and this you can distinguish. On the right side, you have examples where you can see turbulences, for example, and again, um, also a rain. Ode Schwarz has entered the area of millimeter wave imaging uh, some years ago, and now there's a product, or since some years, there's a product so called uh, QPS, a quick personal security scanner, which is used at airports. And uh, this operates between 70 and 80 gigahertz and can create a three dimensional picture in an airport. Only the avatar is shown as, as here on the picture if there's something as suspicious detected. So this security scanner operates uh, in a way here. On the right side, you see um, these so-called squares. These are modules, each containing more, more, each row contains the order of uh, 90 uh, antennas. So to, in total, the whole system has 3000 antennas, transmit antennas and receive antennas. And it's a kind of three-dimensional uh, tomography, which is done each transmit antenna um, it radiates at a certain time and um, successively and the receive antennas, 3000 receive antennas, they uh, take a picture or um, face coherently measure the reflected waves um, at the same time. Yeah, so you get a lot of data and this needs, of course, to be processed. But here you have the specs again, 70 to 80 gigahertz operation range, resolution is about two millimeter and the uh, peak power is very low, it's only one milliwatt. This picture shows uh, or illustrates the concept again. So one TX transmitter irradiating the uh, device, whatever, this could be the body or some other part, and the reflection um, is recorded by the receive antennas. And um, yeah, you can instruct, uh, you can reconstruct the three-dimensional image, image from that. And uh, here's a picture of the gun, for example, on the right side then is the reconstructed millimeter wave image. Actually, this technology um, is also used, for example, for radon testing. There's another product, the QAR, um, to look at the homogeneity of radomes because this is critical for a radar. And um, here is another picture which shows you the three-dimensional uh, nature of the uh, picture which was generated. Another example of a picture which underlines the really high resolution which you can get. Now in the last part, let's have a quick look at channel measurements. Um, that is one activity which is usually done very early in the development of a new standard. So why do we need channel models? Yeah, and the reason is um, explained in the slide that usually if you do link level simulations, yeah, for example, if you develop a new physical standard, then it always starts with a channel model because you have to um, simulate or test how your new physical layer uh, would behave under certain channel conditions. Yeah, this could be dynamic channel conditions or uh, static or quasi-static. Um, but this is the reason why channel models are important and um, always an initial stage of a development a new standard. And especially in the 5G um, early beginning, millimeter waves were new um, because, well, the frequency range was extended up to 50 gigahertz. Now people are considering up to 100 gigahertz and for beyond 5G, even beyond 100 gigahertz. So you have, in addition, you have a three-dimensional, um, uh, for example, 3D beam forming, yeah? So, um, and other behavior in this new frequency range, which is not yet completely understood. So that's always a start for a new, um, yeah, standard development. How do we do channel measurements? So it is also called channel sounding. It, um, yeah, this term 
comes from sonar. Um, I think it's a quite similar principle, for example, from a ship or um, you have a very short pulse, uh, acoustic pulse sent out and then you measure the reflections from yeah, the ground, I mean like from the seafloor, you get an, a picture of your surrounding environment by the reflections. Um, in that case, of course, it's the, the source and uh, the transmitter receiver is at the same place. In the case of channel sounding, you have here two different places. Um, this is shown in this picture. Transmitter on the left side, receiver on the right side. And in between you have um, yeah, the channel, which could be buildings, uh, trees, and so on. So what you do in the beginning is send a very short transmit signal. And this is a um, channel sounding sequence you usually use. Um, it is modulated signal, very short. And then you measure the time delay. Yeah, the first, what you get is shown in light blue is a line of sight, so the direct path. And it has a certain delay because of the speed of light to your time zero. So you measure time delays. And you have another reflection here shown in red, for example, um, reflection from another building and so on. Yeah, And then you get in the time domain a kind of all the reflections um, from your original uh, short signal. Here the channel sounding setup is shown. On the left side you have the transmitter, on the right side uh, the receiver, and in between the radio channel. The sounding sequence uh, comes from the vector signal generator and the IF is then fed to the terahertz transceiver. It's upconverted and with an additional input of the local oscillator from the SGS. Um, in addition, you have the 10 MHz reference for frequency synchronization and the um, time reference, a very precise. So this contains uh, a rubidium clock because you need to measure on the nanosecond level time delays, absolute time delays. On the right side, you have the receiver uh, set up, which is basically symmetric. You have a spectrum analyzer to uh, collect the data and again, a time reference. Our initial measurement campaigns were in factory environments, actually now factories in Teisnach and Memmingen, at frequencies 28 gigahertz because it's new for 5G, and also 67 gigahertz because it could be important in the future, and 3.7 gigahertz because it is the frequency which is used, for example, in Germany for private networks uh, in factories. And um, yeah, so the environment is new. That is why 3GPP had a focus on this kind of uh, environments. And it is also discussed in 5G ACIA. So we contributed with uh, inputs to 3GPP last year. Here this measurement shows an example um, from one of the factories. Um, what is quite Specific for this kind of environment is that you have is after this line of sight. So the first peak is the line of sight peak, um, the direct path, and then you have a very long shoulder because uh, in a factory you have a lot of metallic um, objects, and at this frequency, 28 gigahertz, it's it's a very small wavelength, and almost everything reflects. And um, in addition, what you can see here is that uh, this small uh, circle, this shows the angular distribution yeah, from where the reflections come from. And in the lower part is the waterfall diagram. You see the distance between the transmitter and receiver is continuously increased from three meter to 727 meters. So that's why you see the line of sight um, path moves farther and farther away. Yeah, the distance, the time delay between the Transmit and receiver is getting larger and larger. But what is interesting, you get also another pattern. Um, one of the reflections is coming closer and closer. Um, the farther you go away, so this is a big reflection from the wall. Odin Schwarz has different research activities uh, towards 6G at uh, high frequencies, subterrace frequencies. So one of them is channel sounding. Um, this is in cooperation with the Fraunhofer EIF, so it's Institute for Applied physics and the HHI, Heinrich Herz Institute. So in this case, the Fraunhofer EIF contributes with the indium gallium arsenide MHM technology. Um, so the, basically the turret transceiver. And um, well, this transceiver covers a rather broad range around 300 gigahertz. 
and can be used for transmission experiments, so using um, new waveforms, but also for channel sounding as we use it for. And um, here you have a picture of this transceiver. We did experiments uh, indoor, for example, um, looking at reflections here in the upper part, you see some example, a reflection from a wall or a reflection from the opposite wall, um, and also attenuations of different objects. Yeah, here you have some kind of plastic cover where you see some attenuation, um, some other kind of cardboard box and, and a human being, but just um, yeah, to get an idea what, um, what uh, the behavior of these frequencies is. This was another indoor measurement, so the channel impulse response again uh, versus the delay um, in an indoor environment, also 300 gigahertz, and you see again the direct path, line of sight, um, and many multipath components, which is yeah, specific or which is general for indoor environments. So just to get an idea, um, in a wave, electronic wave travels 30 centimeter in one nanosecond. So for example, the direct path line of sight, this was uh, the distance between transmitter and receiver was four meters around. Yeah. And well, this is a start now which uh, of our research activities. So we will in detail now look um, at different environments and do further measurements to, to characterize basically the channel at uh, 300 gigahertz and also future other frequencies like 150 gigahertz deep end. If you have interest in more details about these activities, please have a look at uh, the following publications. So one is measurement and characterization of an indoor industrial environment at 3.7 and 28 gigahertz. So this is about the uh, factory measurements and the other is a terahertz channel sounding. So um, this we plan now to extend further uh, in the next couple of months. With this, I would like to close the session and the webcast. Thank you very much for your attention and hope you tune in next time.